And first, uh, I want to thank Linux Foundation for providing me the travel grant to make this trip. And I'm a PhD student from University of Hong Kong. And today I'm going to introduce my recent effort on para-virtualizing TCP for congestion control in virtual machines. So this is my outline. And first I will discuss why this research is needed. And next I will try to provide a concrete understanding of the problem. And then I will introduce my solution, a para-virtualized TCP, which we name it PVTCP. So a virtualized data center is very different from a physical data center because all competing entities are virtual machines instead of physical machines. In physical data centers, the network delay is mainly composed of the propagation delays in the, uh, in the network cable and uh, physical hardware switch. But in virtualized data centers, virtualization can bring additional overhead to network RTTs. So basically, there are two types of delays that virtualization can bring to network. The first is I/O virtualization overhead, no matter P, uh, PV or HVM. This is because the guest VMs have no direct control to the hardware, and all I/O traffic must be proxied via a privileged domain called the driver domain or the domain zero. And I want to mention that for HVM, maybe password I/O can avoid it. But for the second type of delays, which is caused by VM scheduling. Because in many scenarios, there will be multiple VMs sharing one physical call. So when you have a scheduling queue, you have uh, scheduling delays. In, in, in our platforms, we find that um, the delay caused by our virtualization of PV guest is sub millisecond. But for VM scheduling delays, it can be tens of milliseconds. Well, uh, for example, when we run two VMs on one side, the peak latency can be as high as 30 milliseconds. And when we run three VMs on one side, the peak latency can be 60 milliseconds. This is because then the credit scheduler uses 30 milliseconds time slots to schedule the virtual CPUs. So this type of delays can dominate the network RTTs. And this picture shows the reality in public clouds. We can see that in both Amazon EC2 and uh, Windows Azure, the network RTTs can largely vary you know, without apparent patterns that people can follow to predict such delays. And another, uh, another problem is in-cost congestion. This, this problem is very hot in uh, physical data centers, typically in largely distributed uh, uh, distributed data, process, data processing applications, such as MapReduce and Web Search. So typically it's a kind of, uh, you know, when um, multiple senders simultaneously transmit data to one TCP receiver, and it features a barrier synchronized workload, means the next request will not be issued until the current request has been satisfied. So the main, uh, the main phenomenon of this problem is that the application level throughput perceived by the receiver, which we call it good put, can be very low and much lower than the link capacity. For example, in this figure, when the number of uh, senders exceed 20, the good put can be lower than 100 one Mbps in a 1 GB link. So a lot of network resources have actually been wasted. And the prior work mainly focused on physical clusters, and there are many Articles and many papers show that all of the listed solutions cannot fully eliminate this problem. And the dominant factor is once the packet loss, whether the sender can know it as soon as possible so that it, it can arrange uh, retransmissions to, uh, to, to retrans the lost segments so as to saturate the network link. Um, in particular, when uh, two loss happens, I mean the two of the TCP window, when, when this kind of loss happens and the senders can only count on the timeout-based recovery methods to retransmit the lost segments. And on the other hand, there's one method that has been shown to be safe and effective. That is significantly reducing R2 mean. R2 mean is a parameter in, uh, in TCP source code and later on I will introduce what is R2 mean. So RTO means uh, retransmission timeout. So even with ESIN support in hardware switch, for example, the, the DC data center TCP called the DC TCP solution from Microsoft. A small R2 means still shows a, very, uh, a lot of benefits to reduce the latency querying delays. 
However, how does this solution perform in the virtual cluster, the cluster of virtual machines? And to my knowledge, there's no prior work. So uh, in this figure, when we run three VMs on one side and three VMs on the other side per CPU call, we can see that when these two machines are connected directly, even when there is no network congestions, RTT still, RTT still specs. And in common sense, RTT is an indicator of the network delays in the hardware switch. However, in virtualized environment, virtualization can bring additional delays to network RTTs. So this kind of congestion is not a real congestion, which we call it pseudo congestion. So the blue points are calculated RTU values, and the red points are measured RTTs. So uh, TCP's low-pass low filter adopts a lower bound of R2 mean to protect TCP's retransmission timer. So we can see that without a large R2 mean to protect the retransmission timer, there will be frequent spurious RTOs. And this figure shows uh, all experimental results uh, using as many as uh, 20 phys uh, physical machines and uh, 70 VMs to about in-cast congestion. So we can see that when you use a small R2 mean, a lot of uh, spurious R2s will decrease the network performance. And on the, on the other hand, if you use a big R2 mean, throughput, will, throughput collapse will happen due to the real network congestion. So it is very difficult to find, a, or impossible to find a suitable R2 mean that fit the whole range. And this is exactly what Allman and Paxson have noted. So R2 mean can be a trade-off between timely response and premature pre timeouts. And virtualized data centers is clearly a new example of this phenomenon. So um, VM scheduling delays can happen on both the sender side and the receiver side. When the sender, when the sender VM is, is uh, descheduled, the arc from the TCP receiver cannot be received until the sender VM wakes up. And when the receiver VM is descheduled, it cannot return the arc to the sender until it gets CPU cycles again. But the nature of these two problems, I found, is very different. Um, in this experience, it shows that when the center VM suffers, a su suffers scheduling delays, RTO only happens once after it wakes up. However, when the receiver VM suffers a scheduling delays, RTOs can ha happen multiple times before the receiver VM wakes up, which we call successful, uh, successive RTOs. And in uh, uh, in this slide, uh, I intend to give you a micro view of, uh, of the problem with uh, TCP dump trace data. So uh, when the sender VM is preempted, we can see that even when even, well, uh, the, 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 rec the receiver VM has returned the arc before the sender VM wakes up, this RTO still happens. So from TCP's perspective, this kind of RTO should not happen because the, 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 arrival of, uh, the arrival time of the arc is not delayed, but its receiving time is too late. So the receiving time is something to the hypervisor now, to TCP. But when the receiver VM is preempted, since uh, the arcs cannot, <coughs> sorry, since the arcs cannot be returned until the receiver VMs get CPU cycles again, this kind of problem, well, RTO must happen on the center side. Well, this is much like a tra traditional networking problem. And uh, in this slide, I'm, I, I, I plan to give you, uh, to, to show you a schematic uh, explanations of what happened inside the guest OS when the sender VM suffers a scheduling delay. So when the VM is running, both TCP sender and TCP receiver can <coughs> progress normally. However, when the, the TCP sender is preempted, the arc from the t TCP receiver need to be stored in the buffer of the driver domain, and it cannot be delivered until the until uh, the TCP sender wakes up. However, after the TCP sender wakes up, both the interrupt, both the network interrupt and the timer interrupt are pending. But RTO happens just before ARC enters the sender VM. This is because due to common OS design reasons, timer interrupt is always exec executed before other interrupts because uh, uh, kernel timers are used to pro provide any other services for, for the kernel, for, for example, for processor scheduling, disk scheduling, and et cetera. And network processing is it's actually executed for a little bit uh, in bottom half. So one may ask, well, spurious R2 is not a problem 
because we have uh, a lot of uh, detection algorithms uh, for, for such suspicious cases. And the center can just restore the, the, the window if the, uh, after detecting such cases. And there are two well-known detection algorithms, FRT and LFI. And LFI performs much worse in some situations than FRTO, so um, uh, it is not implemented in Linux, and we, we adopt FRTO in our experiments. With uh, both scenarios, we find that, well, FRTO, well, delayed arc plays a significant role in affecting FRTO's detection rate. And um, reducing the delayed arc time of value does not help at all. So uh, these, these, um, uh, so the bad phenomenon is, uh, is worse when the receiver VM suffers a scheduling delay. For example, we can see that uh, the detection rate can be as low, uh, can be lower than 10 percent. However, disabling delay, delay, delay dock seems to be helpful. What the main purpose of um, using delay dock is to reduce the server workload. While well, delay dock allowed the receiver to return one arc for multiple segments instead of one arc for each segment. So this, this is much like interrupt coalescing, or we, which I can, I can call it arc coalescing. So uh, we are interested to see, well, after disabling the arc, how, how about CPU overhead? So in this, in this figure, we can see that, well, the disabling delayed arc brings a lot of CPU overhead to uh, both, the t uh, both the center VM and the receiver VM, because each arc will trigger a network operation and uh, network interrupt in both the center side and the receiver side. With more details, we, we investigate how, how many arcs are involved during the, uh, uh, <coughs> during the data transmission. And we find that after disabling arc, more than 10 times of arcs are sent. That's why it causes so much CPU overhead. And to this end, we propose a para-virtualized TCP, PVTCP to address this problem. So the main idea is that we find spurious articles only happen when the, when the VM just uh, suffers a scheduling delay. So if we can detect such, such delays, if we can detect such moment, and we let the guest OS be aware of such, such delays, we have a chance to handle the problem, right? So this idea is partially uh, uh, inspired also by Omen and Paxon. So the, the more information about the current network to the transport layer protocol, the more uh, efficiently it can use the network resource. So how to detect the VM's wake-up moment? Uh, suppose we have three VMs of per CPU call and uh, the guest OS, uh, the, the tick rate in the guest OS is 1,000. And when the VM uh, is, is running, well, uh, it, it actually uh, uh, registers the clock event periodically to the, to, to the hypervisor, and the hypervisor will use a one-shot timer to, to, to provide the virtual timer interrupt so that the guest OS can uh, increment its system clock uh, called Jeffy's. Uh, however, uh, when, when, when uh, the VM suffers a scheduling delay, the pre-registered event can, can only be delivered to the VM after it wakes up. And uh, in this scenario, since the maximum scheduling delay is 60 milliseconds, and it can cause such increase to, uh, of 60 to, to, to Jeffy's. So, if we detect that the system clock does not increase continuously, we, we have some confidence to say that the VM just uh, suffers a scheduling delay and, and it just uh, wakes up. And uh, uh, I, I want to mention that this technique only applies to uh, UP VM. I, I mean, um, a VM with a, a single vCPU because in S SMP VM, uh, multiple uh, vCPUs can update Jeffy's and uh, uh, you, you need to keep local, lo uh, local Jeffy's, maybe local Jeffy's to detect such a uh, wake up moment. So uh, as, as we have seen that uh, when the center VM is, is, uh, uh, suffers a scheduling delays, spiritual articles should not be happening. It can be avoided and we, we, we do not need to detect them. So how? Uh, for, for TCP, when, when, when the center VM uh, suffers a scheduling delay, the retransmission timer's expiry time actually has been extended until the mo moment that the VM wakes up again. But, uh, uh, but in order to avoid that the net network interrupt is executed a little bit than the timer interrupt, in our solution, we slightly extend the retransmission timer's expiry time by only one millisecond. 
In this way, arc enters the VM first, and after it enters the VM, it can reset the uh, retransmission timer with a new timer value. In, in, in this case, spiritual solitudes does not, uh, will, will not happen. There is another problem that once the arc enters the VM, it will be used to calculate the network RTTs. However, the measured RTT has include the VM scheduling delays. And according to TCP's low pass filter, this kind of uh, VM scheduling delays can be tens of milliseconds, well, which will dominate the network RTTs. And it will cause serious inflation to smooth RTT, RTT variance, and finally the expected RTU values. So in all solution, we adopt a conservative, uh, a conservative approach by by, by giving the smoothest RTT to the measured RTT at this moment. And for the receiver uh, side problem, since uh, spiritual RTOs must happen, and uh, so we have to let the sender uh, detect such spiritual RTOs. Uh, well, the call of detecting algorithms is to eliminate the retransmission ambiguity. That is, the sender must distinguish the arcs for original transmission and uh, the retransmission. So, delayed arc, but delayed arc can cause retransmission ambiguity because it's allowed the receiver to return one arc for multiple segments instead of for each segment. So, whether to use the delayed arc is actually a trade-off between the retransmission ambiguity and uh, CPU overhead. Well, we, here we uh, take two uh, detection algorithms, alpha and, uh, and alpha RTO. But well, alpha requires the first arc from the uh, from the receiver after the RTO, and uh, and FRTO approach relies on two future arcs from the uh, from the receiver after the RTO happens. So in our approach, we only return three arcs after the receiver VM wakes up, so that it can it can help both alpha and FRTO to detect uh, suspicious cases. Oh, well, this is our evaluation. Well, uh, uh, in, in all experiments, we create an uh, extreme case by, uh, by uh, so on, on each physical machine, we only use one CPU call. And uh, on this CPU call, we, we run three VMs. And there are as many as 20 uh, uh, senders and one, one receiver. So as we have seen that uh, uh, for TCP, it's, it's, it's difficult to find, find a suitable RT mean to, to uh, for, for the whole range, because it, it cannot distinguish suit congestion from uh, real congestion. But with PPTCP, well, even with a one millisecond P, uh, uh, R2-mean, we, we can achieve the highest throughput in, in the whole range. And for CPU overhead, uh, as, as we know that, uh, uh, as uh, we have seen before, that um, <coughs> when, when there's no network congestion, for TCP, it needs a very large R2-mean to protect the uh, to, to, to absorb the RTT specs. Uh, so in, in, in all solutions, with PVTCP, even we use one, one millisecond R2 mean, we can achieve almost the same performance as TCP with a large R2 mean. And with more details, here we, 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 uh, we, we show uh, the total arcs involved. And with P, when the center VM is preempted, since spiritual RTOs can be avoided, no additional arcs are introduced. But uh, when the receiver VM is uh, is preempted, uh, since the delayed arc needs to be temporarily disabled, and the uh, we uh, PVT speed introduced 7.4 percent more arcs. But compared with the solution that totally disabling the delayed arc, this this kind of solution I think is uh, very lightweight. So before I conclude my search, uh, my, my, my research, I'd like to raise one concern. Well, um, we know that when the VM uh, has been descheduled, all, all uh, in incoming packets need to be stored in the buffer. So the buffer size matters. Uh, the default value is only 32, which means that uh, it can only uh, store as many as 32 packets at a time. But in data center networks, for 1 GB link and 10 GB link, the TCP's window size can be well uh, uh, as uh, uh, as high as several hundreds or even several thousands. So a lot of packets are actually dropped um, due to this uh, small buffer. So maybe this parameter needs to be set bigger.
And let me summarize my work. So the, the main problem is that um, VM scheduling delays can cause pseudo congestions to TCP and uh, the sender, uh, sender side problem and the receiver side problem are very different. And to this end, we provide a, a, P, a PVTCP and based on a method to detect VM's wake up moment. For the sender side problem, uh, spiritual RTOs can be avoided. For the receiver side problem, uh, spiritual RTOs can be detected. And future work, well, uh, I, I need your input. That's why I come here today. <laughs> So you're ready to take, you're ready to take questions? Uh, okay. George, please. Uh, I'm going to schedule this such that I don't have to run around too much. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you. This has been very informative. Uh, thank you. Talk. Thank you. And um, I was wondering if, so the, a lot of the things you said, particularly with the, having the very long um, uh, scheduling quantum, um, yeah, you've been quantum, thinking yeah. about actually changing the, the default to that to be much lower in, in Zen server, I'm uh, sorry, in Zen. Um, so have you tried it with a shorter quantum with like you know, 10 milliseconds instead of 30 milliseconds or five milliseconds instead of 30 milliseconds? Uh, yeah, yeah, in my solution, I, I, use, I use the default one, 30 milliseconds, yeah. but I think there's, uh, there's, there's no free lunch because if you reduce the, 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 uh, the schedule, uh, scheduling time slash length, mm. well, uh, maybe uh, there will be two problems. The yeah. first is the reduced uh, CPU cache effect the second mm -hmm. is increased uh, VM uh, contest switch. So there's no free lunch. So in, in, in many scenarios, well, uh, I think VM scheduling must happen mm -hmm. so as to properly al allocate uh, CPU cycles. So this, can, this kind of delays cannot be fully eliminated. So uh, my, my, uh, in my research, I, I'm going to think about well, how we can live up with this kind of latencies instead of avoid it, right, instead right. of hide it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. If, if if your goal is to so yeah, you're right. So we are going to have some delays, no matter what. Um, and given that we're going to have delays, having really bad delays helps your you test the, the limits of your your thing. Uh, part two. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's fine. Um, also, have you um, have you tried this with Credit Two? Credit Two. No. No. Okay. Because Credit Two was designed in part to address um, particularly this kind of issue with the. Um, the, the, the delayed ACK things and, and, and the effect that that had. Okay. So I'd be interested to see what, what, well, we, what kind we, of results yeah, I will try to lead on. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. We have a lot more questions. So in the meantime, presumably that link Gail, uh, shows your full paper, right? And it's my, my full paper? Yeah. Okay. Uh, part of the, this paper has been uh, published in ICMP conference and uh, part of the work has been submitted to another conference and the review, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I did see you uh, submitting a paper on Xen Project under the research yeah, uh, column. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you go to Xen Project and research, I think you'll find. Okay, I'll do this efficiently this time, so I don't have to walk too much. <laughs> have you done any testing on jumbo frames? Jumbo frames? Yes. Um, actually, uh, uh, in, in, in my experiment, I, I, I um, vary the block size, but I, I didn't uh, uh, investigate too much about the jumbo frames. The, the block size is uh, maybe uh, chunked into multiple frames by, by TCP, so I didn't, didn't care uh, too much about the details. You might look at that because that changes things radically when you thanks, go up to thanks, large thanks. block sites, especially for storage. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks. This is, this is all very interesting. Um, Thanks. Well done. Um, I, I just had one comment just at the end there. You, you mentioned that maybe a buffer size was too small. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you're probably aware of this already, but there's, um, there are difficulties with just increasing buffer sizes in circumstances where um, the buffer isn't going to be serviced soon. You can get very, very long um, RTTs as a result and that also makes TCP perform very poorly. And this is the, the problem of excessive buffering has started buffer to be recognized problem, as, right? a, as a problem. So you mean buffer, buffer flow problem, right? Buffer flow. Yeah, buffer flow. flow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm aware of that problem. But uh, I, I think uh, for some latency sensitive, uh, for some latency sensitive uh, applications, uh, buffer flow is, is really a big concern. But for some other ap applications, for example, bulk transfer, we, we, do, we do not care about latency, we, we just uh, care about the that's, throughput. 
Through that's, I'm, I'm afraid that's not the case. Um, so to give an extreme example, um, if I use my mobile internet from my laptop on the train, I sometimes experience uh, RTTs measured in hundreds of thousands of milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, minutes sometimes. And of course, under those circumstances, the proportion of the data that's being buffered that is actually useful is very small because it consists mostly of retransmissions of the same stuff. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so, and also you end up with a situation where the uh, TCP tries to estimate the RTT mm -hmm. and if you have too large a buffer, the RTT mm -hmm. varies too much and you end up with a lot of spurious retransmissions all being buffered up. Um, so, you, you need to, really the only sensible way to do this, I think, is either to have not have very large buffers or to somehow um, cap the time that a particular mm. frame mm. might be in any buffer mm. to a, a sensibly low value. Um, so that if the buffer is being serviced quickly, mm. then that's fine. Then obviously you need, if you've got a big fat pipe, you need a big buffer. Mm. Um, but if maybe the VM is descheduled and suddenly the, the, the host has a, a great, you know, CPU crisis, or the VM um, has, a, you know, isn't isn't able to deal with with the incoming data. Then you need to stop buffering stuff, and you need to start throwing it away instead. Thanks for coming. So, yeah, yeah, um, this parameter needs to be chosen very carefully. Maybe a new research problem. That's why I use the term perhaps. I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But in my experiments, I think uh, a, a, a large value matters. Do we have any more questions? I saw a lot more hands raised earlier. Uh, do you also test with various TCP versions, for instance, TCP REST2? I seem to recall that um, some TCP versions are less sensitive to the del uh, delay variations and stuff. You mean TCP Vegas? Or uh, TCP West 2 or some. TCP I don't. Re I don't really remember remember oh. the exact version, but I mean, what I meant is, do you test with various TCP versions, or which TCP version do you? A uh, TCP New Reno. A New Reno. Yeah, yeah. New oh, Reno. I see. But as far as I know, the t the default TCP version in Linux is TCP Cubic. Yeah, it's default one, but um, you you can you can ch uh, you can change it uh, at runtime. Uh, TCP, and, and Cubic, the, BIC, and uh, uh, West Wood, the Scalable, and many yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And uh, my question is, do you also have uh, observed uh, similar results with TCP Cubic or other versions? But uh, I think this kind of delay is not, not specific to one kind of congestion control algorithm. Actually, it is generic to all TCP algorithms. Well, um, uh, I think um, all TCP algorithms need to rely on more or less on RTT measurement. So this problem, I believe, also affects TCP cubic. Okay. Yes. Any more? Uh, it's just to follow up on this this buffer thing. Uh, the reason why uh, this has such small uh, TXQ land I don't know, is so you... to uh, prevent. Um, is to reduce the amount of memory that can be used up memory. by inside the driver domain or DOM zero by guests not handling their packets. If every if you have a, you know hundreds of bits uh, in a driver domain and each one could queue up ten thousand packets, uh, I mean that that's the reason why it's thirty two, <laughs> not ten thousand. In addition uh, to the yeah, buffer bloat issue. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I think. Uh, for example, the, the aggregated buffer sizes of all uh, guest domains should should have have something to do with uh, the the network link capacity, right? So so if it is only one GB link, you, you do not need to maintain a very large buffer. You need a very small buffer, and for for multiple guest domains, that's my viewpoint. Uh, actually, I have one question regarding this, uh, this buffer buffer size. Buffer size. You, I don't know. No, uh, you meant the buffer in the back end, right? Mm. If the buffer, uh, if the buffer is full, then does the does the front end tries to send the packet, or it 
Does the front end just wait? Uh, so, so your question is, uh, if the buffer is full? Full at the back end side. Full in the back end. Yeah. Then, uh, then the driver domain just uh, drop the package. Ah, drop the package. Yeah, drop the ah, package. Okay, that's okay, why, yes. I, 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 that's why we, it will cause intensive uh, packet loss. If, for example, if the TCP window is uh, 100, and you have only a 10 buffer size, the rest 90 packets will be dropped, then we will cause serious distortion to the TCP level. And, and that drop happens at the back end domain, back, uh, back end driver. Sorry? Does the drop happen at back end? In the back end, yeah. In oh, the back end. Yes. Yeah. More questions? Uh, I have one. Um, uh, so is the code somewhere already available for that? To Sorry, look uh, uh, actually, uh, the solution, the implementation is very, very simple. Actually, you can implement a solution on, on your own. It's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> Because it requires no modification, no modification to the hypervisor. Of course, I can uh, release my own source code. Well, maybe next year, maybe. Uh. Okay. So in that case, uh, <clears throat> um, if we have no more questions, um, we we can get ready to go for lunch. Um, yeah, yeah. Do find me uh, during the lunch if you are interested in this uh, topic, because I, I really need your input. <laughs> Um, so please be back at 1.45.